Hello. Hi, is this Melanie? This is Melanie. All right. This is Tiffany. It is. Let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome a returning guest to Crag Live. She is an actress and a writer. Uh, just came out with a brand new book and its audiobook version, Odd Woman Out. We are very excited to welcome Miss Melanie Chartoff to the show. Uh, welcome, Melanie. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to touch base with you a year later. We started I at the know. beginning of the pandemic, um, yeah. I think, meeting and having a show together. And here we are a year later. We're alive and optimistic, and um, I feel really grateful you know that everything for us worked out yes i was telling terry i was like you know it, it's been almost exactly a year since we had melanie on the show and she you were the first guest we had you know since la went on lockdown and now returning yeah. a year later i'm hoping that you're going to be the blessing that's going to help us end lockdown yes that's my job that's my <laughs> job i would be the blessing <laughs> well i i know i personally say my prayers to the uh, goddess melanie chartoff every night <laughs> so yeah so i want to Good. find Don't out because too much <laughs> <laughs> when you were on the show uh last year a year ago you you wrote something which was very interesting read it on the air now that's not something that's in your book but it was similar uh was that kind of uh you getting into this type of thing that you basically had the idea of doing this book when you were on a year ago oh well actually before that terry sorry i'd like to give you the credit for all the inspiration <laughs> but i actually <laughs> had been performing a lot of those stories around town <clears throat> in prior years i actually had done a musical version of pretty much that book called Odd Woman Out. Um, I was commissioned by the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival and created a one-woman musical and um, trotted it around, did it at several different theaters. Uh, but a, a literary agent saw me performing and she said to me, you know, this is delightful, but this is a book. She said it has literary merit mm -hmm. and it has spiritual heft. And I think you'll reach a lot more people outside the theater by writing a book so she got me started she kind of mentored me through the whole process mm -hmm. and a year later i had really put it together um it sorted out what it was germane what wasn't um you know i could have written this book actually many years earlier but having the happy ending of meeting my mate very late in life kind of gave me a a topper an unusual topper for the book um, I was pretty happy in my 50s with myself. I was alone. I didn't have any responsibilities to anyone but myself. I had started writing. I was starting to get things published. And I could have, you know, finished a book then, quite self-satisfied. But one thing I hadn't achieved for myself was having a successful, loving relationship, which my parents weren't able to have. So it was very important to me to create my own family and create mm -hmm. my own joyful loving relationship and having achieved that at a very late age well it, um, it's kind of a uh, odd thing i know you call your book odd woman out but you're you're both in the fact of not only a liberated woman but also a romantic which you don't often find in the same person well you know it's feminist big secret you know that as independent of voices we want to have and as much choice as we want to have most of us still want to surrender to some guy that'll open the jars yeah. you know, and, <laughs> and pick up the pick up the bugs pick up the bugs off the floor and um you know i know a lot of romantic feminists um it, it was kind of a shocker for me when i was in my 30s that all my ardently feminist friends were suddenly <clears throat> getting married and getting pregnant i mean i felt really odd you know at that point because it was clear that i had not lived my life making the choices that would lead to that kind of life I was living a kind of itinerant gypsy life, you know, going project to project as an actor. And I hadn't made room or had made room in my own heart for a really serious relationship that would lead to children in marriage. I, I hadn't done it properly. You know, you don't realize sometimes that the choices you're making along the way will lead to a certain kind of life. And then that was when it hit me in my late 30s. Oh, I haven't made choices that would lead to a family. So it was a little late then to catch up, but I made a good try. Right. And now, it did have a relationship, but it didn't go to marriage. For those for those that haven't read the book or gotten the audiobook version, just so that, that everybody knows, this book is a little bit different in the fact that it's not really written in a linear kind of beginning to end narrative. It's a collection. It's it's exposure through essays. So it's a series of essays and stories that 
encapsulate different pieces and parts of your life. Why did you decide to do it that way versus doing it kind of a beginning to end like a lot of biographies are? Well, um, it, my life has been lived episodically, you know, where I would go from show to show, truncated little experiences, and I would go episode to episode on television. So I've kind of always lived an episodic life. You know, I'd play one character for a while, and then I, a year later I'd be playing another kind of character, sometimes simultaneous characters. And so for me, that's the best format, right. <laughs> you know, for a book. Um, every, in, every chapter in the book... Uh, it was about a moment of self-realization or a turning point, whether it's in my childhood, you know, when I was just in grammar school or junior high school, or whether I'm in my teens or 20s or starting out on Broadway or starting out on television. And I've worked with a lot of very famous people, but that's not the gist of the book. It's not really a Hollywood tell-all. That's just sort of the background, the backdrop against which I grew. Um, and I was a very slow grower. What can I say? It took me a very long time to become a grown-up woman. Right. I now, don't think I got there until I was in my 50s. <laughs> I was still like this child, this free-spirited child. You had mentioned uh, that you worked with, uh, with a lot of people. One of the things that I wanted to ask you is because in, in listening to the book, uh, what was interesting to me is that it almost seemed to me that you were very cautious at some points mm -hmm. as far as who you would and who you wouldn't name. Now, there was some people that you did name. Uh, there was others mm -hmm. that you kind of kept them ambiguous. When you were putting this mm -hmm. book together, how did you decide how far you would go? And were you concerned that anything was going to be said or any stories were going to be told that would upset people? Well, mainly my parents. My late dad would not be touched by the book. Um, my mom is 97. And I have uh, given her an audio book with certain chapters expurgated. I think that she's the only person that would be troubled by things said in the book. Mm. Um, the men that I didn't mention, they know who they are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, in those relationships, in retrospect, I found, I found myself as much at fault as they. Because I put up with, you know, a lot of things that in my right mind I wouldn't have. Um, so I can't completely blame them as a consequence. I didn't want to smear them, you know, before their families and their children and in their lives at this late date. Right. Well, I know you mentioned you had yeah. issues towards the end of the book uh, with your sister. I don't know if those have ever been resolved, but uh, did she give you any comment on the book? She hasn't read the book. I'm not sure she knows about it. We travel in very different circles. She's a university instructor in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, she teaches at City University of New York, which is pretty much remote now. But I think um, she knows about the book, nor would she be interested in reading it. We have not really been close in a while. It makes me very sad, hence the story. Um, but she's a very different person than me. And because she lives on the East Coast or in Brooklyn, close to the East Coast, she has been more responsible for, you know, my parents and her husband's parents and it seemed to be a role she took on with, with uh, delight and creativity, but in her older age, she's feeling kind of resentful that so much of her life was devoted to caretaking, yeah. and I could only get in, you know, a few days after these crises and emergencies arose. You know, it would take me a while to mobilize to get from the West Coast to the East Coast to be there for my mom or be there for my dad. So I think there's a, it's a very common resentment when one sibling feels they've gotten stuck. Right. And I think we have that sad phenomenon in our family. I've tried to make up with it, you know, might make up for it financially and with uh, great gratitude. But um, I don't think it does everything that my showing up and living in New York or living in Connecticut might have done to ameliorate the situation. Right. Well, it kind of educated me. I was always aware uh, that Italian families often fought. But I didn't realize that people, you know, of the Jewish persuasion <laughs> got into as much scraps as what you guys did. Are you kidding me, Terry? <laughs> oh, my. I mean, have you watched Woody, read Woody Allen's books or any of the Jewish neurotics that spawned comedy in, in, in Brooklyn in the, uh, in the 80s, the 70s and 80s? You know, all that um, great humor comes out of the turmoil, the familial turmoil. And I think most of us Jews... Um, we're living with the pogrom and Holocaust mentality of our parents and our grandparents. My parents and grandparents were still running, mm -hmm. you know, in their minds and still hoarding so right. they'd have enough to live on. 
And so my sister and I, when we were little, we were just pratfallers and punsters and always pulling pranks, you know, anything to get them to laugh. Because if they could laugh, they wouldn't be depressed for a while. So I was kind of a compulsive comedian when I was a kid. And my sister, too, I think she got over it. Because she married a lot younger than I did and had a, you know, wonderful husband that really adores her, still adores her. Um, But no, I was... um, you know, I was a product of a difficult family situation. My parents did not get along, and that's why remedying this by getting along with my own husband so well has been a real, you know, a real arrival for me. That's yeah. why I felt successful right. enough as a person to write the book. It, it really helps to have a husband who's a psychologist, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty handy, I have to say. Now, I, and, um, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you just uh, enjoying the book from a, a female standpoint, uh, there is, and, and maybe you can expand on how you felt about this, because there there is a lot of stories in the book where you completely bear yourself, for, for lack of a better word, both emotionally, but also, you know, in a sexually liberated way. In, and in fact, there some, is, some of it made me uncomfortable right. because I'm a guy <laughs> and, and have a lot yeah. of old-fashioned ideals. But. There is still, even though we are in 2021, you know, there still is that creeping mentality double standard out there that, you know, if mm. a guy is sexually liberated, well, he's a stud. And if a woman is, then she's a, you know, she's a whore, for lack of a better word. Were you ever... Yep concerned about bearing yourself and 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 telling your truth like you did to think that people might look at you differently or have a different standard for you than they would many young men in Hollywood well yeah it was a concern um, Tiffany but I, it takes courage to come come clean about yourself and one of the motivators for me was that I was meeting a lot of young career women who hadn't found love and didn't see it as a possibility for themselves who, when I told them I was getting married for the first time at 65, said, you're giving me hope, and I want to understand how this happened to you. So there was a a kind of a sense of responsibility in wanting to talk about the terrible choices I made. My book is more of a how not to than a how to. Mm -hmm. I think in in rather funny ways, I point out, oh, that is a red flag choice that I should not have made, but there I went, blithely along, making that stupid choice, letting that man into my life, letting that man into my home or body, and um, I had heard a talk by Erica Young, Um, you know, Terry, you might remember her, she wrote a book called Fear of Flying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and, in the the 70s, I think it was, she was kind of a role model for women's sexual liberation. Um, she, She talked in a certain kind of street way that people hadn't heard before, and when she gave this talk, which I heard a number of years ago, She said, I don't write a book unless there's something missing from the cultural conversation that needs to be said. And so I thought to myself, we were in the midst of the Me Too movement, you know, 2017, and in the midst of Trump, Trumpism, you know, the things that he was saying, blatantly sexist things that he was saying in the news on a constant basis. And I hadn't heard much about women my age um, talking about their Me Too moments, you know, about their... Uh, problems in dealing with assault and not knowing what a restraining order was back in those days. Um, So I thought it was important that this come out of of somebody my age's mouth to prove that we were not just all repressed and and shut down and waiting to be married. I'd be dead if I had done Mm -hmm. that. But that we um, we were also one down in the patriarchy. We were also coping in our own ways with uh uh, intrusive men, disrespectful men. So um, it felt like it was willing, I was willing to risk my reputation, uh, which is easier to risk at this stage and age, let's face it, um, than I might have been a few years back. Right. Well, one thing that and was... I thought, I thought, go ahead. No, go uh, ahead. No, you, you go, go ahead. Now. Well, now I have stepchildren. Yeah. And, um, you know, Stan's kids are in their, uh, one is in his late 20s and one is in her 30s. And they're pretty smart and they're pretty grown up. Uh, she's a, a, a therapist, so she knows everything. And he's been around. And I thought, what would they, they think? And they are actually kind of thrilled by my honesty, um, the fact that I'm so upfront about all this. You know, for a while I played the role of the wholesome step 
mom mm-hmm. to Stan's family, his new the new family I was coming into. But after a little while, they began to tell me what fans they were of the writing I was having published in a lot of literary magazines and in the Jewish Journal. And they seemed to welcome my um, my kind of out there approach to self exposure. Right. Well, I hope so you get uh, many many grandchildren because I know that that's one thing in your life that you always long to be able to do was to have a child. It was kind of a sad series of events because you wound up being involved mm-hmm. with a man that was controlling and a not so nice guy. He kind of tricked you into relationship mm-hmm. and then horrors of all horrors and, and made me cry because, you know, I think a lot of you and, and to hear mm-hmm. that literally he forced himself on you and you wound up getting pregnant and had no choice but to abort the baby and then mm-hmm. it wound up in a situation to where you couldn't have a baby anymore later on because you had to have mm-hmm. a hysterectomy and all of a sudden you were longing for children. That had to be rough. Mm-hmm. It was, and, and a lot of women go through this, Terry. You know, there are a lot of women who have had that kind of loss. But the miraculous thing that happened for me, and this is pretty recent, because I've always wanted a grandchild. I've always, like, I had I wrote a song called step-grandmother, you know, about mm-hmm. my longing to not necessarily be a mother at this late age, because I wouldn't have the energy, but to be the third lap from the origin, um, to be the, the one that holds the baby and that brings the baby gifts and then leaves when the baby starts, you know, getting angry or antsy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, my, my stepchildren do not see children on their immediate horizon, but I'm at the right age now. I'm just have this clenching in my hand. I have a biological imperative to be a grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I've been mentoring this girl, Angelica de Los Angeles, since she was about 11 years old. I was matched with this inner city girl who was at risk of not finishing school or going to college. Um, It was an organization that was matching up at risk inner city girls with professional women uh, who were childless or unmarried. And um, She and I hit it off, and she's now 27. She got married a few years ago. I was at the wedding. She's a social worker. She Mm. has her degree because of DACA. She's an illegal, but because of DACA, she was able to get her license and working papers, and it's been a really great ride for her. And she was pregnant, and she said to me, I want you to be my baby's grandmother. Oh, very nice. So she was born a few months ago, five months ago now. I've only held her a few times, but now I get to be the auxiliary, you know, the person that will take her to the theater, the person that will take little Julie, um, you know, to games and things, and, and will do things with her that her parents are too busy working to do. So I got it. I got it late, but I got, I got it. Right, right. Uh, so I wanted to ask, though, because... You know, everybody, and you'd kind of alluded to this, uh, everybody was kind of used to your persona that they saw on, you know, TV, whether it was in one of the the sitcoms that you were on or one of the series that you were on. Uh, And everybody just thought of you as either kind of the the safe, you know, Melanie, uh, or they thought of you as funny Melanie. Uh, But a lot of people say that comedy comes from pain. Uh, Do you feel... If you ha- if you could rewrite your life, here's my question. If you could rewrite your life, would you take out any of the bad stuff that happened, or do you feel that that contributed to who you are? Well, you know, um, it, it, it's strange, but most comedians will say they come from tragedy, as you guys know. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the humor comes from tragedy. And um, it was definitely, comedy was definitely a coping mechanism. <clears throat> But I was able to cope creatively, and that, that gave me a career. But I think I would really like to come, have come from a happy family where there was more love. Uh, you couldn't feel the love in our house. It was like people were Teflon for actual heart-to-heart attachment and contact, you know. I mean, I knew my parents loved me in some way, but I couldn't get it to go. Out in the world, I did not feel loved unless I worked my ass off to get a laugh or to entrance people in some drama. That was the thing that I wish I'd had younger. Oh, what a better life I would have had. What much better life I would have had. Do you and think, I think I still would have had a sense of humor. Do you think you um, would have been as yeah. driven as you are, though? Because, I mean, acting and creativeness kind of became like your shroud. That was your escapism. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not, Tiffany. I mean, maybe I wouldn't have been quite so driven if I'd been accepted for myself as a child, you know, without having to excel and strain and stress. Um, 
I don't think, you know, my father later in his life became very approving of me and very loving of me. Uh, we, we reached a place of forgiveness between us, and he let me know that he was very proud of what I had accomplished. Oh, good. And, um, yeah, he had saved videotapes of every show I had ever done, I found out after he passed. Mm-hmm. Um, but even though he passed away, letting me know that he loved me and that we forgave each other, that daddy is still in me, you know, that yeah. inner daddy is still there somewhere. It's a factor that's internalized now. So, um, yeah, I'm well, not I'm, sure what I would have turned out like. Mm-hmm. I really am not. Well, I'm, that's a very touching part of the book for anybody who gets yes. the book, the, the the part. And I won't tell the whole story because they should get the book for that. But, you know, the, the yes. part where you are visiting him in the hospital towards his end days. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it, I, I got to say that a large part of your mother is in you, too. I mean, she gave you a big surprise in the fact that she tried to live her life like Ozzy and Harriet and wound up towards the end being more like Gloria Steinem. <laughs> in the fact that she made a decision after years of, of basically abuse. Now, I don't assume there was any physical abuse. There was a lot of mental abuse and a lot of control. Mental, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that she decided to walk away from that marriage and just shocked you, right? Yes, because she was in her 60s when she finally decided she wanted to live alone for the wow. first time and find out who the hell she was. Wow. And she um, first she moved in with another woman who was leaving her husband at the same time. And they got a secret apartment in New Haven, Connecticut, and basically wore disguises, you know, wool hats and sunglasses <laughs> and <laughs> big coats all around so they wouldn't be recognized so their husbands couldn't track them down. And then she decided she, she was working and she decided she wanted to live alone. So my mother, this last 30 years of her life, has discovered herself and she's proud of herself. I mean, she I got to hand it to her. She did therapy. She did Codependence Anonymous. Um, she came very clean with me. She would say what she was thinking and feeling even if she was angry. And um, she's been a real role model because I kind of came into my own in my 60s, too. Yeah. Right. Now, I have to ask if you can share just a little bit of, uh, of one of your stories. And I know that you talked about this uh, when you had your, your book premiere on Facebook. But when you started talking about your experience on the Johnny Carson show, I was going, mm. I was thinking in my head, oh, God, what did Johnny do? And then it did. No, we've heard, as we've much heard as we stories. love Johnny, we've heard stories. We've heard stories. That, that Johnny was a, a bit of a skirt chaser. Skirt chaser. Yeah. And I, I was just waiting to hear, and I didn't hear that, that he was out of line, but I was really expecting to. But you were, rightfully so, a little bit nervous that day when you were on The Tonight Show. Can you can you tell our listeners a little bit about that 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 event? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, it was a dream of of my father's that I would be you know if I was going to pursue this cockamamie career that I would be successful and be on the talk shows he was a big follower of Steve Allen and Jack Parr and then of course Johnny later in life and um, it was my dad's dream come true that I'd be in that chair but as I you know I had been prepped for this they have a, a they had an auxiliary producer on the show who would give you interesting questions and decide which ones you know would be funny and so I sort of knew what Johnny was going to ask me. I knew the ballpark of what he was going to be asking me. But it was pretty improvised because out of ten questions, he might have just picked one or two and then expanded on those. So um, I was all made up and quaffed. I had my hair done. I had a great dress. My agents were like nervous, you know, fathers pacing in the hallways. And as I came into the light and I heard Doc Severinsen's great fanfare introducing me and my high heel went up on the dais and Johnny shook my hand and Ed McMahon shook my hand and I sat in the chair and I made eye contact with Johnny. I kind of turned into an an altered personality. Hmm. I was on automatic. I don't remember any of it. It's like I had a concussion or something because I, I seen clips of it later and I seemed to pull it off okay, but I was just in an out-of-body situation. <laughs> I was not really myself. And I did the pre-patter, you know, the pre-planned plan, patter and answered the questions, but I was really, I was hostile, I think, in order to just fend for myself. I was kind of hostile. Well, you, you know, got a secret way of uh, not getting nervous. I mean, you say something in your mind, right? 
Yes, that's right. I um, I was very intimidated by people were, that I was meeting because I was right off the you know New York off Broadway and Broadway stages, and then thrust into a a limelight with a lot of really big stars. I mean, really, really big. I was screen testing with them. I was meeting them at social gatherings. I was invited out by you know to date by some of them. Um, and it was like it, very intimidating. So in in the book, I talk about. And I teach this technique to people who are easily intimidated or get shy with people they feel are more powerful. I would say curse words at the person under my breath while I was smiling, and it gave me some measure of self-control. And it was also it also tickled me to death to be saying "f you" to Johnny Carson <laughs> sitting there. He would probably Being laugh if he heard. He would probably enjoy it. He'd just laugh it off. He was good. pretty nice to me. I I have to say I was not one of the women he hit on. I think he really enjoyed playing Ronald Reagan to my Nancy. He had <laughs> me back on this show to to do that with him. And he actually told me to hit him in the head at one point when he said something dumb. And I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah, hit me hard." He wanted me to hit him in the back of the head when he was making a mistake as Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. so that he hit the mic with his forehead. <laughs> and I was terrified after that I'd really hurt him. And he said, no, no, that's exactly what I wanted. The audience loves to see me, you know, you know, fooling around and getting hurt and stuff like that. So I got through it. You know, I got through doing it twice. But I was really in a sort of state of hysteria. And, and anxiety mm -hmm. that made me feel like was not myself at all. I don't know if you ever had that kind of anxiety at such a level that you yeah. feel like you're not in your body and you still have to function. Yeah. There's, to there's function. something about showbiz people that get through it and they fall apart later. And you, you had an issue driving away from the Burbank studio, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you had to bring that up. Yeah, I hadn't been driving when I lived in New York City, although I love driving. I hadn't driven for many years. And so when I came out here, I, I bought the first car I saw, which is a Chevy Vega off the lot, a used Chevy Vega. And when my agents walked me out to my VIP parking spot in the NBC parking lot, um, it was one, you know, a very uh, primo place. It was next to Johnny, next to Ed McMahon. I mean, this is quite a spot. And uh, my little crummy Vega was parked there. And when my agents walked me out to the car and they were applauding and they were saying how well I'd done, I couldn't wait to get them off me so I could just get in the car and cry. So I got into the car, put on the safety belt, smiled, waved at them. And instead of putting the car in reverse, I put it in drive. And I hit these yellow, you know, fence, this yellow stone thing. I forgot what it's called. A kind of a barrier, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and I'm and it like indented my bumper, oh. and um, I, I ground on the gears to back away from it, and finally got dislodged from it. I mean, it was really embedded, and my agents were going, "Are you all right? Let us drive you home. Are you okay?" Said, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm getting rid of this car soon anyway. Don't worry <laughs> about it. And then very aware of how I looked, you know, I again put the car in gear and ran it forward instead of in reverse and hit that thing again. A second time, wow. And, <laughs> yeah, a second time. That's how freaked out I was. And then all the way home I cried, you know, in embarrassment and humiliation, and I said to myself, I'm never going to do that mm -hmm. again. I don't care what Johnny wants, I'm not going to do it again, because it was such an anxiety-provoking event. But I ended up doing it again because I didn't have my wits about me. Yeah. Um, I just read Lorraine Newman's, you know, listen to her audiobook. She's one of my friends, oh, uh, yeah. long-time friends. Love her. Hers is coming out in a couple weeks. Yeah. And um, she had a similar incident where she felt like she was so anxious that she didn't know what she was doing. She, yeah. did, she was just behaving in a kind of a, an automatic manner. So, uh, yes, that was a, you know, I got rid of the car. <laughs> Which, you know, before I could get rid of it and afford another car, I mean, it had these yellow, deep, you know, gashes in it. So anybody would know <laughs> that I was a horrible driver. Well, you didn't really me. make any money because the time NBC paid you, you had to get your car fixed every time. So <laughs> <laughs> it didn't did do you any good. You know, speaking of Lorraine Newman, now, uh, she was very similar in the fact that Saturday Night Live, of course, was first. But you did Fridays, and I was uh, very interested in the one part of your book where and I wonder if Lorraine went through this too with the SNL cast, to where of course you were uh, part of of uh, a group you know that consisted of guys and girls, and you said that you would pitch ideas to uh, the, the writers of uh, Fridays, and a lot of your ideas were kind of like Nick's because basically you were a woman. It was a, more of a, a a guys think tank, 
Uh, I don't know if Lorraine ever went through this, but I was uh, very surprised to hear that they kind of, you know, didn't welcome your collaboration as much as they should have. No, I was so, I mean, I had a few sketches that went all the way to rehearsal periods, but then were cut. I wrote some of the jokes on the news, um, but I didn't get much material on the two other ladies on the show, Mary Edith Burrell, who I'm still in touch with, and the late Brandis Kemp, who passed away. Yeah, I was so ago. sad to hear that. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, really sad. Great woman. July 4th, she went out with the fireworks. Oh. But she, uh, <laughs> the three of us created a, a singing troupe called the Muzak Sisters, and we later called them the Elevator Sisters. They were women who sang like um, acid rock and, and like Devo songs, like Muzak. You know, like. When a problem comes along, you should whip it. Um, you know, and other hits by the Rolling Stones. Uh, right. yeah. We would do them like elevator music. And uh, we had a big gay following, and they did repeat that, those characters a few times. Yeah. So that was something we created. We only had one female writer on our show, and she was one of the guys. You know, she really played with the guys. So our, our female gaze was not shared, you know, by the writing staff. And they, they were great guys, and they wrote us some great stuff, but... We didn't get to create any of the characters or incarnate any of the characters yeah. uh, that we wanted to. And I'd say that uh, Gilda Radner, because of her affiliation with, uh, with uh, Alan Zweibel, got uh, most of her ideas immediately hatched. Right. Uh, Lorraine didn't have that good fortune. She was uh, she and Jane Curtin, with whom I'd been on, on stage off-Broadway for a while in an improv musical review called The Proposition, back in 1972 or 3 um, she also felt underwritten for you know she had the news like I had the news on, on Fridays but not enough of her characters except the Conehead character yeah. um, were created to the show and she was brilliant I, I, I mean having worked with her for just maybe 6 to 8 months uh, she was a terrific talent but that's the luck of the draw you know some people have chemistry with the writers and Certainly, Michael Richards had a lot of chemistry with the writers. Well, I was just very surprised, very surprised to hear that because Fridays always came off as kind of the more hip, more progressive version of Saturday Night Live. So I think it's surprising to hear that there was a certain element of sexism there. Well, they did write feminist sketches. Um, they did really try to be fair, and it wasn't necessarily that they wanted to repress us. They just didn't get our humor. It didn't make them crack up like it did us. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I wrote a piece that I thought was brilliant, and they all loved it, where uh, a woman and a man spend the night together. Me and Larry David, we spend the night together, and the next morning, I'm seeing him, like, on film through a filter. He looks beautiful, everything is lit beautifully, and he sees me through this kind of fisheye lens, right. video lens. And um, they thought it was brilliant, and then it just, they, they, they d ditched it at the last minute. But that was one of those male gaze, female gaze things right. that, um, you know, just didn't enjoy it as much. And I have to say, some of the pieces I wrote, they were risque for the times. You know, I don't think we've seen menstrual comedy in anything but Barack's new movie. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think you've probably seen it by now, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. Yes, yes. I don't want to spoil it no, for no, you. No, no, we But even, it. you've seen it. But that was, to me, that was a little bit too vulgar. It didn't look like make women look good. Right. Um, and I'd written a thing about other uses for stay free maxi pads, where you could stick them on your hands and use them to clean counters. Yeah, why not? Or use them as <laughs> underarm, you know, sweat pads or whatever you call them, perspiration pads. And they just didn't roll with that. But they did write a, another kind of menstrual sketch, much ho more wholesome, where. Um, Brandis is trying to tell her mother, Mary Edith, that she's gotten her period for the first time. And she says, Mom, it's my time. And her mother says, what time? What, you want to go to school? I mean, what are you talking about? She just didn't understand. The daughter was much more sophisticated, in other words, than the mother. So that was cute. They did put that menstrual humor in the show, kind of to appease us. Well, you know, we all uh, have relationships at, at work in a professional manner, and sometimes it can be very difficult if you have a relationship personally with somebody from work. Now, you were living with the head writer of Fridays, and you said that he was a big problem in the fact that, that he tripped out a lot on cocaine. And, and he kind of was controlling because, like, he would write things and, and be very dominant and saying you need to say it this way and that way. And how much of a problem 
was it dating somebody that was one of the head writers for Fridays? Well, he wasn't the head writer when we met. Actually. Oh, okay. Uh, for me, it wasn't any kind of climbing, you know. No, no, I didn't think that. On. Yeah. No, we had shot the pilot together, and there was this big party, and he uh, he followed me home. And, um, you know, one thing leads to another, but um, we weren't living together. I, I didn't make that big a mistake. Um, <laughs> but we were... You shouldn't we sleep where you lie, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you not work where you sleep. Yeah. Um, you shouldn't, you know, c- get it involved to the extent that we did, especially when there's no no exit strategy we couldn't get away from each other we were together six days a week 12 to 16 hours a day six days a week and it was just there was no escaping each other we watched each other on the monitors he would be directing a scene that i was in and when he became the head writer that's when it became more problematic because he didn't want to show me any favoritism uh to make it look like he was giving me material because we were um aligned shall Mm -hmm. we say and uh it was very crazy making because I wasn't a drug doer. I was a very professional person, you know, at this point. I had no. gone through my smoking of dope and stuff like that earlier in my 20s. Now I was in my mid to late 20s. And I was, um, you know, very um, concerned with professional deportment. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these writers had never worked in theater. They didn't know, you know, the proper, you know, carriage for mm-hmm. people working on a television show. It, it wasn't like theater, I'll tell you that. It was pretty wild. Well, you know, you would get that impression from watching Fridays. I mean, it, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to believe that some of them were using some drugs. I know we <laughs> we had on the actress that was uh, in, in a movie with, with one of your co-stars, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, together again. You know who I'm talking about. Is she... Mark was, Lankin, yeah, yeah, she was talking about, like, the cocaine was flowing, okay? And I don't know, like, yeah. how that went down on Fridays, if there was a lot of that or not, but I, I guess... They were very open and frank about it. Um, our our co-producer, Jack Burns, um, who directed a lot of the episodes, too, was an incredible coke addict. Oh. Snow bunnies is what uh, Lorraine calls them. And he, um, he would drive us to death all night long because he couldn't sleep. And we would be up, he would find some unique u- news report and want to create a, a whole sketch about it with all of us in it. So we would be planning to leave at 10 o'clock at night, and it would be 2, 3 in the morning, and we'd still be flying. Mm. So that really affected me. I would get just exhausted and fed up and and try to cut corners. He would repeat the same thing and paraphrase the same thing over and over and over again that we had all gotten on the first statement, you know. (laughs) And so he he flaunted his coke usage, which eventually got him thrown off the air by ABC. Yeah. he would go on with white powder on his nose, and, and it was all sex, drugs, rock and roll. They would say that with great pride at the beginning of the show, yeah. and I would be just humiliated and ashamed. I really felt terrible about it. Yeah. Now, one of the but things that was part of the, the late night comedy culture. I mean, um, you know, that was going on. It, it looked like it fit on, on that show. It, it fit. It just looked like it's natural. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> One of the stories that you tell in your book, and and I wanted to ask if you had ever gotten any feedback from your your father, but one of the stories that you tell in your book is about um, one of the guest stars you guys had on Fridays, which was Henny Youngman. And I know that your dad was a Henny Youngman fan, but I also know that even though your dad, based on your book, may have had his rough edges, that probably and assumedly... Part of that came from you were daddy's little girl and you shouldn't be out in New York and L.A. and doing this and you should be doing what he thinks you should be doing and that kind of a thing. So Mm -hmm. did he ever make any comment on his opinion of what he thought of that situation? Because I guess Henny Youngman got a little bit handsy. Oh, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, My father kind of got a kick out of Henny Youngman copping a feel off his daughter. And that really (laughs) stunned me, really shocked me. My father kind of, you know, photographed me all the time. He was photographing my sister and me in our bathing suits when we were, like, teenagers. I mean, he really was proud of us, of our our bodies. It was very confusing, as you can well imagine. Um, There are pictures of me, you know, in bathing suits from, like, the time I was 11 or 12. And then my sister and I rolling ourselves up in in a beach blanket because he was taking pictures of us while we were sunning in the yard. And so um, he thought he was a great photographer. He had this highfalutin camera, 
and he would pose me and you know and I'm thinking of it now I blush it was just so I cooperated because I was daddy's little girl yeah. right. you know and uh and um, he had pictures of me on his stock brokerage desk when I came to visit him. He had pictures of me in a bathing suit. <laughs> I said, Dad, oh, okay. this is an office with professional people. You've got to get that off there. I made him put it away or yeah. put it face down. Um, yeah, it was very undignified. Well, I so, want you... you know, uh, I had a lot of mixed feelings about yeah. it. Yeah, I want you to know I'm, I'm very disappointed in uh, cult radio guest Ed Asner because <laughs> he was he was on our show and I don't know why I, I was surprised to hear that he got a little handsy too and that story's in the book it's a great story but you know he is a sex symbol for so many of my girlfriends I have to tell you this <laughs> that we okay. all thought Lou Grant was one of the sexiest men yeah. you know we'd ever seen he was hairy and he had a great deep voice and you know he was just the cutest we all thought so and um you know, he's played a lot of very flirtatious roles. And uh, I had known him. I'd been in plays with him. We were kind of like family for, for years and years. And um, that particular night, I think he's feeling great about himself. He was winning a, an award that night from a humanitarian organization. And um, he's feeling really good about himself. And I can't say that <clears throat> that, that uh, little pat on the fanny was egregious you know it wasn't like worthy of lawsuits and assault yeah like al franken's little transgression that was <laughs> right like, God, that was so nothing compared to what women endured you know I, but I it think wasn't just with me he had also kind of put his hands in his his nose in, in marion ross's hair she's the mm. mother in happy days right. if yes. you remember sure she's a very straight laced wonderful lady she was presenting him with the ward the award and he came up behind her and buried his nose in her hair mm. and uh, put his arms around her and she was just like so uptight and unhappy and she rushed off the stage and handed him his award and I thought there are 400 people gathered here maybe he's going to make a little speech about the purpose of flirtation during these Weinstein post Weinstein me two days right. maybe he was going to educate us about the necessity of older men appreciating young women maybe he's going to say something really profound and when he didn't address it, I was very disappointed. Yeah. Because I was willing, we were all willing to go with him, you know, on any train of thought, because he was such a hero. I, I think he battles generation. between wanting to be manly and, and knowing that people expect him to be the grumpy old... They expect him to be the curmudgeon. Curmudgeon, dirty old man. Huh. Wow. Well, he had just done a guest star <clears throat> spot on uh, The Good Wife. You know, with Jul Juliana Margulies, yes. in which he played a lecce old politician who's offering her money to run for office, but he's making it very clear that there'll be a price to pay. You know, and she's just, her skin is crawling. You can just see it. So when yeah. I saw him that night, I complimented him. I said, God, you were great as that dirty old man. That was so wonderful. <laughs> so I thought, well, did I provoke? And then they said, oh, let's have a picture. Ed and Melanie, let's have a picture. So I thought maybe I provoked it. He thought I did, you know. But anyway, so I'll take a little of the heat for that. <laughs> yeah, it's just absolutely. That I, I wish that he, you know, Joe Biden and all those, like Al Franken, could just say, you know, we're old-fashioned guys and we really appreciate women. We right. really appreciate the beauty of women. We'll just have to learn a different way to express it now. Right. I mean, none of them really come out and said that, God, you know, I've hurt your feelings. They all say, oh, if I've hurt somebody, I'm surprised and I'll never do it again. Yeah. But I think there should also be some man making a comment how on how beautiful younger women are or older women and how great they smell and how tempting their hair and you know to really come clean about it because there is a, a chemistry that's undeniable between older men and younger yeah. women right I, I was raised differently I, I'm so conscious about being manly and not touching where you're not supposed to I don't even touch them at a strip club like they sit in your lap and I'm afraid to touch them because that's just <laughs> me I come from the Ozzy and Harriet era and then yeah. I don't know. A lot of guys are not like that. I, I like that. I think that's a wonderful <laughs> quality. You're being so respectful of women. Um, so you two are Italian? No, we're French. Yeah. Oh, you're French. Yeah, yeah. so I was going to say your name. Yeah. I thought you said you came from an Italian family, Terry, so I thought a little... No, I, I love the food, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love your story about you almost getting sucked into a spiritual retreat. And, and the yeah. thing that shocked me the most, it wasn't even a big part of the story, but it kind of floored me to know that, that somebody that was so high on life was looking for answers, that John Denver was there? 
John Denver was there. He That's was a big crazy. aficionado of Muktananda. Yeah, and there was a whole news crew. I think that some of those great gurus who came from Pune, India, where they had no egos and bad skin and, you know, didn't have much... Uh, much fanfare in their countries of origin when they came here they became big stars and i think muktananda was thriving hmm. on the popularity that he was feeling and he knew that television stars were a way to get more of that you know illustrious following and so i think i was granted that that retreat and that gift of his attention because he thought if i were a convert to his way of living my life, that it would bring him more converts, yeah. hence more money for the ashram. Yeah, it was kind of a shocker. One of the things that I thought uh, was great about your book is that there's so many different audiences that could benefit from reading your book. Uh, you know, not only young women who are trying to figure out who they are or figure out how to figure out who they are and, and find some kind of sense of independence. Um, people that maybe are, are looking for love and haven't found it and are feeling hopeless. But also, really, I think, in my opinion, that young uh, aspiring actors and performers and creatives should read the book because yeah. it, it, this isn't a biography that you wrote about, oh, the, the, the wonderful part of Hollywood and what fame was like. It's really about all of the struggle that you did, the... the the passion that you had to have and and the obsession almost that you had to have to make it and then all of this crap that you had to deal with in the interim uh including mm. you know the one story where you're talking about kind of you know doing broadway and things like that which is not easy uh and you guys you got hurt on one certain production and right fell a big long distance very long distance and i was not alone in that fall yeah, I um, I think, you know, it's interesting that COVID shut down Broadway theater, um, and we all wonder if it will come back as it was, you know, ever. Um, but I think that uh, anybody who buys the book who wants to be an actor, who wants to be in theater, will get a kind of a time capsule of what being on Broadway was like in that period. Uh, what aspiring to be in a new, groundbreaking, bleeding-edge kind of production was like. And... Um, this was a show which was kind of a precursor to Spider-Man, which you may remember a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. Put a lot of actors in very physical danger, actually injured number of people. Um, there was a desperation to get technology onto the, onto the stage so that it could compete with films. We were going to create the kind of illusions that they could do on location in films on the stage. So in this particular show, it was a space uh, age rock opera, sci-fi, set in a uh, you know, 2100 or something like that. Yeah, with and Raul Julia. Was, yes, Raul Julia. I had my first big stage love scene with Raul Julia mm. that was really thrilling. And in any case, um, this was a cutting-edge kind of show, and they had all kinds of unusual special effects. For example, there were trampolines set in the stage to make it look like craters, and they had kind of lava rocks around them, <laughs> to make it look like we were leaping weightless from one crater to another. We studied movement, you know, with a special choreographer. I remember Debbie Allen was the assistant to the choreographer, but we had to, you know, move in slow-mo on the stage and jump in the air really slowly, come down, floating. It was brilliant, really brilliant. Gall McDermott, who wrote the music for Hair, wrote the music. The score was incredible, yeah. but there was no dialogue. It, the whole story was sung. So the, the audience was going to have to understand the story from the lyrics, which were very poetic and kind of metaphoric rather than literal. Yeah. Um, so we in the chorus kind of knew the show was in trouble well before we went into preview. And we knew because a lot of the technology wasn't working, Raul, who was a garbage picker-upper in space and a dumper of garbage um, because Earth had been filled with garbage for many millennia and now was needing to dump his garbage elsewhere. It was very advanced thinking. That's kind of where we are now. Mm. Um, his, his spaceship would come in over the audience out of the rafters. It was really a thrilling effect, and it kept getting stuck up there, so he couldn't make his entrance onto the stage, onto this other planet. And that slowed us down, and the costs were going up and up. I mean, it was like a million and a quarter, a million and a half were going down the tubes. And we were all painted different colors because we were rebels from Earth, where everybody was painted blue and wore control hats to keep them from feeling anything unique or different. 
and um, the makeups were always like causing skin problems and getting affixed or underarms you couldn't get it off at night mm. and then the one big effect was that at the end of the show we were all to rise on a kind of a fire escape staircase mm -hmm. into a enormous rocket ship whose tail was on the stage we'd been building it all through the show to escape to a distant planet because earth was about to come down to get raul and kidnap all of us back to earth so on the last preview or the second to last or the first preview um, we were trying out all the effects for the first time and the chorus as directed was getting onto this fire escape and rising into the tail of the spaceship as the orchestra was playing this thrilling finale song and the winches in the New Year theater it was a brand new theater were pulling loose uh, out of the cement mm. in the ceiling way above the stage and the staircase kind of rocked back and forth and then it swung and then it hung from one side and it hung from another and suddenly we were plunging down, 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 like three stories oh my with God. 20 to 5 people on this staircase wow. through the trampoline in the stage. It was like a classic, classic loss of virginity. And I saw my resume pass before my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't see a life pass before my eyes. I saw my credits, my summer stuff credits, my soap opera credits. And I was saying to myself, well, at least I made it to Broadway. Right. Not at least I got to love my parents, or at least I got to fall in love and have a child. It was like, at least I made it to Broadway. This is all I had to say and for you, myself. You thought it was going to be okay, because they, they tried to make you be nude, and you fought that fight. You won, and you didn't have to be nude, and everything's <laughs> going to be okay, and no. then the damn thing's falling apart. <laughs> I know. Wow. So there was a lot of um, press about that, and then the show ultimately closed. A few days after it opened, our notices were terrible. Uh, everybody wanted to see the show because it had become a conversation piece. Right. Uh, you got to see this thing before it goes. Because it was beautiful to look at. We were all painted different colors. The music was fantastic. The orchestrations were in quadraphonic sound. I mean, there were speakers all over the house. Some inside us, it felt like. You know, our bodies were throbbing with the music. Um, but ultimately, it was not a hit. So my first first Broadway show was really a dehumanizing kind of sobering experience well hey there was nowhere to go but up right <laughs> <laughs> yeah and my next broadway show was such a delight it was a, a, a version of the adventures of scapan a moliere play done in like a british music hall style and the young vic from england came over to do it and i was the first american in it um, I played uh, a girl that cries all the time to get her way and that was really fun and i that was um, i ran that for about 6 months very happily we had great crowds and i got signed by the william morris agency and then they started flying me out to los angeles to audition for things and it became clear that my life was going to be in los angeles right. because i could make so much more income and have so many more choices here than i was having in new york now here comes here comes the the life reflecting question because you, you've done this book you know, it, it has a happy ending, but throughout your life, you've had so many different careers, really. I mean, you've, you've been an actress, you're, you're a writer, uh, not only writing, you know, uh, stuff for, for TV, film, stage, but, but also now a, a book, and you've done voiceover, you know, with, with your work on Rugrats and other stuff. What is your favorite, what makes you happiest in life, Melanie? What's your favorite role yes. in, in the play of your life? Well, she said Miss Musso. I saw that on <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I, I said that was definitely one of my favorite roles, playing that villainess. Yeah. Um, it, she was such a, uh, a wretch, a narcissistic, vain wretch. And I had such a good time doing that part. Well, I don't think it's over yet, Tiff. I mean, I do think there'll be other roles. Um, and there are more roles for mature women than there were before. Now, if Meryl Streep would just get her hands off of them, <laughs> um, maybe the rest of us could have her shot. But, um, yeah, I don't feel done yet. I'd really love to do, uh, you know, for me, the joy is working with really talented people who mm -hmm. all want to go deep and imagine the imaginary, the alternative world, just as much as I do. Craft is really important to me still. Yeah. And working on my, my technique and, uh, you know, it's just always been important to me. And um, I do see other roles ahead. I've been doing Zoom plays, which has its limits, but also has its triumphs. And um, I hope that theater will come back and I'll get to do more stuff live. And also, I, I'd love to do an internet series, a streaming series. You know, maybe not carry a series at this point, but to be one of a great ensemble of people or a cameo uh, in some really well-written piece. I'm really a, 
at addicted to great writing. Well, I'm glad to hear and that. I, I'm glad to hear that because a lot of times once people get to becoming people that were in front of the camera or on stage, once they get to writing, they decide I'm done performing. I'm just going to write now. That everybody's want to know. Well, I, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say everybody out in the audience is, is prompting me to find out. I don't know if you're involved or not, but I heard they brought back a lot of the original cast. There's a reboot of Rugrats. Are you involved with that or That's not? Right. No, I'm not. It's mm. very different. It's CGI. Um, a lot of us characters are not in it right now, uh, if at all. And um, it's very much focused on those few Rugrats babies. Uh, okay. Dill Pickles isn't in it, the little baby. But Tommy and Chucky and Phil and Lil. And then they have other uh, children of other genders and other colors. Mm. And it's going to be a much more child-centric world. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the mom's role will be as pivotal as it was. I was so fortunate to have that role for so many years uh, and have be associated with it for 30 years. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nickelodeon. Uh, but I think it's going to be very different. And I think it's probably going to be just as great. I'm sure they'll have great writers like we had. And I think it debuts pretty soon. Yeah, so it'll, it'll be on uh, the new service, Paramount Plus. It, it came from CBS All Access and is now Paramount Plus. It'll be... Uh, uh, Paramount produced all our Rugrats movies, which yeah. I, I was in three of them. So that that's an interesting fit. Now I get that. Do, yeah. Doing the voiceover so no, work. I'm, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, doing the voiceover work had to certainly help you in doing your audiobook, which we very uh, much enjoyed because you do voices in there. And you do your mom, you do your dad. And <laughs> I, I got to hear you talk Jewish. You know, it, it was fun. <laughs> that's thrilling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it was fun to do the audiobook. I had done a lot of, uh, you know, commercials, voiceover commercials, and I had done other audiobooks in the past, but it was really fun to tell my own stories. It was almost like performing them on stage. You know, I really got to enact them from deep inside right. and uh, really be my mother, you know, to really not do the Edie Pickle send up yeah. of my mother, which I, <laughs> I did for so many years, but to be a more mod- modulated mom, right. you know, and speak the way she did. And, um, you know, her journey is a big part of the book. Right. Her journey to maturation is kind of parallel to my own. Well, God bless her. I know she's still with us. And I'm so happy that you're happy. You met, <coughs> excuse me, the man of your life. I'm glad you're over yeah. the fact that he had a bald spot because that bothered you. That was a funny part, <laughs> funny part of the book there. Not because he's less adorable, but because of what it means. It's yeah. so emblematic of my own growing older, too. You know, we're going to get old together. That's yeah. the deal we made. We just started a little closer to it than most couples, you know. And I'm <laughs> we were really talking about the will, right. you know, when our first year of marriage. And I'm really glad that, that you uh, fed him well, and he got to be off of a sleep athlete machine, because I'm trying to get off of mine. Okay, maybe you can oh. help me out and give me some advice here. Yeah, but... give up cow dairy. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I wish Are you going to do it? Yeah, I'll do anything, but I don't think it's that, that easy for me. I, I don't know, just... I'm, I'm You'd be surprised. <laughs> try giving it up for a, try giving it up not for one day, not for two days, for a month or two, and yeah. see how things clear. Really, really. So, okay, last really? last question. This one, I, I won't give the full story behind it, but it, it's just a funny little stupid question. Do you have a unrequited hate for Catwoman now? Because. When I heard that, is she part, still alive? She oh yeah, is. no, she's still alive. And in, she in is fact, still uh, alive. she she's been on our show. And there was a lot of people that you mentioned the book was on our show, so we really enjoyed all of that. <laughs> no, but somehow no. you uh, and Catwoman, like she kind of came between you and and what could have been a husband, but wound up not being a husband because of Catwoman. Yes, well, because of Catwoman and because of Vietnam, um, yeah. you know that had it, it had its pull too. Yeah, that was shocking. I thought my virginity was the thing that attracted him the most. But it was Catwoman. Um, and I thought that would, <laughs> that would, yeah, I thought that would keep his interest. But then Catwoman, you know, <laughs> she's big and tall and definitely not a virgin. So her fame trumped my virginity, and that was a sad moment in life. Right. And you kind of hinted uh, further on in the book that you didn't like cats. Is it because of Catwoman? Or? <laughs> 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 God, that's a good thought. No, I can't say it's because of cat. When I loved all animals, but in the book, you'll find there's an incident that, that turned cats and I apart. 
Yeah. Right. So, um, but I'm back with them again. It's not all cats. It was just this one particular cat. Well, good because you know when this whole crazy pandemic is over, Melanie, we would love to have you and Stan come over. Uh, you oh. know, come over for a dinner and maybe even do the show here in person. And I don't have a a baby for you to hold, but I do have three cats. So, oh. <laughs> are they on the kitchen table when we eat, or are they no. in another no. room? No, they are not. Okay. <laughs> One of them's well, so old she can't me, even get to, up there. To meet you guys, I would have a cat in my lap. I would willingly have a cat in my lap. <laughs> well, I, I must say because I've written for uh, magazines for years, so you know I'm a bit of a writer myself. And, and I always make a joke that because I earn a living at, at writing, that I don't read because I don't want to like work. When you know <laughs> I'm not working, but uh, I, I did right. enjoy your book, and it's it's the first book that I went through from cover to end uh, in in centuries, and I really enjoyed it. Well, I, I, wonderful, and good for you for being so open minded. I mean, I, yeah. a lot of my readers are men, and they're learning something from their own, you know, uh, histories about what women felt about them right. and what what it was like from a female point well, of view. Well, I, I must admit, at, like I said, at, at first. When I heard some of it, because I'm looking at things from a, a men's point of view, it made me a little uncomfortable. And I, in fact, told Tiffany, I said, well, you have to do the interview because I'd be too embarrassed to bring up some of the things. <laughs> but it, it's okay because you're, you're Melanie and you're like, you know. That's what I told him. I was like, she's our friend. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. You'll be Aww. fine. Uh, well, oh, again. Poor, we, your, your poor Terry is like going to need, you know, shock treatment, <laughs> I think, after this book. But it, it's very interesting. It's, it's funny. It's revealing. It, it's heartwarming. And, and it's all there. And you're very honest. And you're very good at expressing yourself. And if you are a Melanie Chardoff fan, and who isn't, uh, you can find out more about you in this book than any interview you mm-hmm. would ever do. Because, you know, it, it's the real you. Yes. The book is called All and I have- Now. Uh, the sorry. book is called Odd Woman Out. We encourage all of our listeners to pick it up. You can get the audio book, which is narrated by Melanie herself. Uh, you can get it in ebook format for your Kindle, Kindle and things like that. Um, or y- this is something that you don't get to see too much anymore. You can actually get a real book and hold it in your hand, which I think is fantastic because that's an aesthetic that's been lost in and of itself. So. Thank you, you guys. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble too. Perfect, perfect. And uh, if anybody wants to get, I don't know if this is even possible. A lot of right people now, like to get a autograph. Uh, but yeah, is there a way to get an autographed copy of the book? I mean, yes. People that listen to your show can send me an email at playdate four 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 at gmail dot com. Send me proof of purchase and their mailing address and to whom they'd like it personalized, and I will send them a. It's a replica of the cover. It's a uh, a bookmark postcard, and it could be a coaster later on too. And I will <laughs> mail you one of those with proof, proof of purchase and your personal address provided. Perfect, perfect, Melanie. It is always a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. And let's get through the rest of this damn pandemic so things can go back to normal. Great! I can't wait to get that cat in my lap. <laughs> and we all look forward to hearing you on my friend uh, Dave's radio show. So uh, we got you uh, contact oh, thank with Thank you, thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, we're going to meet tomorrow. Yeah, awesome. very good. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks, you guys. Take good care. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.